Chapter 26, A Million Strong. Intelligence, what is it? This isn't a trick question, or maybe it is. Either way, it is what academics were talking about as Bill Clinton's crime laws drove the unintelligent black narrative. What scholars were arguing is that intelligence is so relative, it's impossible to actually measure fairly and without bias. Uh Uh-oh, this notion virtually shook the foundations of the racist ideas that black people were less intelligent than white people, or that women were less intelligent than men, or that poor people were less intelligent than rich. It shook the idea that white schools were better and even poked at the reason white students were perhaps going to wealthy white universities, not because of intelligence, but because of racism in the form of flawed and biased standardized testing. Enter Richard Hernstein and Charles Murray, Harvard guys. They wouldn't stand for this kind of talk. No, no, no. They wrote a book refuting it all. It was called The Bell Curve, Intelligent and Class Structure in American Life. The book argued that standardized testing was real and valid and most important, fair, which meant that black people who were disproportionately doing poorer on these tests were intellectually inferior due to genetics or environment. I wish there was something new to add, but as you can see, the entire history was a recycling of the same racist ideas. Not the most original people, those racists. The year is 1994, and Hernstein and Murray's book was published during the final stretch of the midterm elections. New Republicans issued their extremely tough contract with America to take the welfare and crime issue back from Clinton's new Democrats. Funny how all things new feel so old. Charles Murray jumped on board and started to rally voters and campaign for the Republicans by encouraging and rationalizing the anti-welfare bill called the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. Personal Responsibility, hmm. This was another one of those get-overs. The mandate was simple enough. Black people, especially poor black people, needed to take personal responsibility for their economic situation and for racial disparities and stop blaming racism for their problems and depending on the government to fix them. It convinced a new generation of Americans that irresponsible black people, not racism, caused the racial inequities. It sold the lie that racism had no effect, so black people should stop crying about it. It became a game of one-ups. The Democrats were tough on crime and welfare. The Republicans got tougher. The Democrats got tougher. Then the Republicans got tougher. So tough, they tried once more to get Angela Davis fired after University of California Santa Cruz's faculty awarded her the prestigious president's chair professorship in January 1995. She was still a threat. But how could she be a threat? while at the same time, Republicans were claiming racism was over. What would she be threatening? What would she still be fighting? Why would she need to be fired? Not to mention 1995 was a year that made clear racism was far from over. I mean, 1995 was when the O.J. Simpson thing happened. The trial, I know you know about it. If not, he was accused of killing his wife and her friend, both white. The trial split the country in half, with black people rooting for O.J.'s acquittal and white people rooting for his imprisonment. It was like watching the worst reality show of all time. The year was 1995 when the term super predator was created by Princeton University scholar John J. DeLulio to describe black 14 to 17 year olds. Murder rate was up among that age range, but so was unemployment. Of course, DeLulio left that part out. The year 1995 was also when the biggest political mobilization in black American history took place, the Million Man March. It had been proposed by Louis Farrakhan, leader of the Nation of Islam. Though the march was powerful in its groundswell, it was flawed in its sexism, which Angela Davis spoke out against the day before the march. The year 1995 was when activists would come together to defend the world's most famous black male political prisoner, Mumia Abdul-Jamal. He had been convicted of killing a white police officer in Philadelphia in 1982, though he claims innocence. 
a book of his commentaries was published that year, live from death row. His execution was to be August 17, 1995, but because of the protest, Mumia was granted an indefinite stay of execution. And where was Bill Clinton when all this was going on? Not at the Million Man March, that's for sure. He was in Texas pleading to evangelicals for racial healing. Instead of listening to the people dealing with it, he went to beg people not dealing with with it to ask God to fix it. And of course, it slipped into pray God fixes black people. Even though a year later, affirmative action, action was banned in California, making the playing field, especially as it pertained to higher education, more lopsided. The percentage of African Americans at the University of California campuses began to decline and the push for the end of affirmative action would spread all under Bill Clinton's watch. A year later in June 1997, Clinton gave a commencement address at Angela Davis's alma mater, UC San Diego. It was as if suddenly he had seen the light, the irony, and pledged to lead the American people in a great and unprecedented conversation on race. Racial reformers applauded him, and black women had something to say, a nudge, you know, to get the conversation started. And when I say black women, what I mean is one million of them. On October 25, 1997, in Philadelphia, a million black women gathered to have their voices heard. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Sister Saluja, Winnie Mandela, Atala and Alasha Shabazz, daughters of Malcolm X, and Dorothy Height all spoke, but so did white men, not at the march, but in the media. And what they argued in response to Clinton's statements was the way to fix racism was to stop focusing on it. Wrong. But that's what they said, and sentiment set the tone for what would become colorblindness. Pause. Take a breath. How many of you know that I have a black friend person who then follows the statement with this one, but I don't see color? Yeah. Unpause. This colorblind rhetoric seemed to have its intended effect. Segregationists and assimilationists started forever favoring the colorblind product nearly a century after the Supreme Court had ruled in favor of separate but equal. And it had the same effect, lip service. The millennium was coming and people still couldn't fathom equality because of color. They used a new multicultural paintbrush over a racist stain and a single coat wouldn't do.